Hello everybody and welcome to the Difficult Conversations podcast series. In addition to my normal podcasts, I will also be recording readings from some of my favourite books, which I've managed to pick up again due to the pandemic. So get a cup of tea, enjoy and take a look at what I'm learning from and loving in the book world at the moment. Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life, by Marshall B. Rosenberg. If violent means acting in ways that result in hurt or harm, then much of how we communicate could indeed be called violent communication. I'm going to read to you a poem from the book by Ruth Babermeyer. It's called Words Are Windows or They Are Walls. I feel so sentenced by your words. I feel so judged and sent away. Before I go, I've got to know, is that what you mean to say? Before I rise to my defence, before I speak in hurt or fear, before I build that wall of words, tell me, did I really hear? Words are windows or they're walls. They sentence us or set us free. When I speak and when I hear, let the love light shine through me. There are things I need to say, things that mean so much to me. If my words don't make me clear, will you help me to be free? If I seemed to put you down, if you felt I didn't care, try to listen through my words to the feelings that we share. I'm now going to read the foreword by Deepak Chopra. Everyone clings to their history with a vengeance because it anchors their identity. So when Marshall advocated peaceful talk, he was advocating a new identity at the same time. He fully realised this fact and he states about non-violent communication and the role of the mediator in this new third edition He said, we are trying to live a different value system whilst we're waiting for things to change. In his vision of a new value system, conflicts are resolved without the usual frustrating compromises. Instead, the contending parties approach each other with respect. They ask about each other's needs and in an atmosphere free of passions and prejudices, they reach a connection. Gazing on a world rife with war and violence, where us versus them thinking is the norm, and where countries can break all bonds of civilised existence to commit unbearable atrocities, a new value system seems far away. At one European conference for mediators, a sceptic criticised Marshall's approach as psychotherapy. In popular language... Isn't he asking us to simply forget the past and just be friends? A remote prospect, not just in the war-torn areas, but in any divorce case. Value systems are packed in the luggage of every worldview. Not only are they inescapable, but people are proud of them. There's a long tradition around the world of prizing and fearing warriors at the same time. Jungians tell us that the archetype of Mars... The volatile god of war is embedded in everyone's unconscious, making conflict and aggression inevitable, a kind of inherent vice. But there's an alternative view of human nature, eloquently expressed in this book, that must be considered, because it's our only real hope. In this view, we are not just stories. These stories are self-created fictions that remain intact through habit, group coercion, old conditioning and lack of self-awareness. Even the best stories collaborate in violence. If you want to use force to protect your family, guard yourself from attack, fight against wrongdoing, prevent crime, and engage in so-called good war, you have been co-opted by the siren song of violence. If you decide to opt out, there's a sizeable chance that society will turn on you. In short, finding a way out isn't easy. In India, there's an ancient model for non-violent living known as Ahimsa, 
which is central to the non-violent life. Ahimsa is usually defined as non-violence, although its meaning extends from Mahatma Gandhi's peaceful protests. Do no harm would be the first axiom of Ahimsa. What so impressed me about Marshall Rosenberg, who passed away at 80, just six weeks before I write this, is that he grasped both levels of Ahimsa, action and consciousness. These actions are well described in the following pages as principles of nonviolent communication. To be in Ahimsa consciousness is much more powerful and Marshall possessed that trait. In any conflict, he didn't choose sides or even care primarily what their stories were. Recognising that all stories lead to conflict, either overtly or covertly, he focused on connections on a psychological bridge. This is in keeping with the other axiom of Ahimsa. It is not what you do that counts, it's the quality of your attention. As far as the legal system is concerned, a divorce is over once the two parties settle on how to split their assets. But this is far from the result that's reached emotionally between the two divorced parties. Too much has been said, to use Marshall's wording, that changed their world. Aggression is built into the ego system, which totally focuses on I, me and mine whenever conflict arises. Society pays lip service to saints and their vow to serve God instead of themselves. But there's a huge gap between the values we espouse and the way we actually live. Ahimsa closes this gap only by expanding a person's awareness. The only way to resolve all violence is to give up your story. No one can be enlightened who still has a personal stake in the world. That could be the third axiom of Ahimsa. But this seems like a teaching as radical as Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, when he promises that the meek shall inherit the earth. In both cases, the point isn't to change your actions, but to change your consciousness. To do that, you must walk a path from A to B, where A is a life based on the incessant demands of the ego, and B is selfless awareness. To be frank, nobody really desires selfless awareness. From the viewpoint of looking out for number one, it sounds at once scary and impossible. What's the payoff if you despise the ego, which is all about payoffs? Once the ego is gone, do you sit around passively like a spiritual beanbag? The answer lies in those moments when the personal self falls away naturally and spontaneously. These occur in moments of meditation or simply deep contentment. Selfless awareness is the state we're in when nature or art or music creates a sense of wonder. The only difference between those moments to which we can add all experiences of creativity, love and play and ahimsa is that they flicker in and out whilst ahimsa is a settled state. The only difference between those moments to which we can add all experiences of creativity, love and play, it reveals that stories and the egos that fuel them are illusions, self-created models for survival and selfishness. The payoff for Ahimsa isn't that you upgrade the illusion, which is what the ego is always striving to do with more money, possessions and power. The payoff is that you get to be who you really are. Higher consciousness is too lofty as the term for ahimsa. Normal consciousness is more accurate in a world where the norm is so abnormal that it amounts to psychopathology. It's not normal to live in a world where thousands of nuclear warheads are aimed at the enemy and terrorism is an acceptable religious act. They are merely the norm. For me, the legacy of Marshall's lifelong work doesn't lie in how he revolutionised the role of the mediator, valuable as that was. It lies in the new value system he lived by. Ahimsa has to be revived in every generation because human nature is torn between peace and violence. Marshall Rosenberg gave proof that entering this state of expanded awareness was real and when it came to settling disputes, very practical. He leaves footprints that the rest of us can follow. If we have true self-interest at heart, we will follow. It's the only alternative in a world desperately seeking wisdom 
and the end of strife.